Well, good morning. Let me add my welcome. My name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. It's great to have you with us here on Res TV. We're continuing in our series on the book of Revelation, and we're coming to a difficult passage in Revelation chapter 17. And it's difficult because of the fact that it's chock full of symbolic imagery, as much of the book is, but also because it brings up something uh, that is triggering of all sorts of cultural sensitivities for us. It centers on a prostitute. So let's start a little bit with those cultural sensitivities. Uh, Terms like prostitute or whore or slut and the like are often used in ways that are are deeply misogynistic. Uh, Our culture has used these kind of labels uh, to refer to sexually promiscuous women, uh, but we do not really have equivalent terms Uh, for men. In fact, men are sometimes celebrated for their sexual promiscuity, while the very women with whom they cavort are shamed. So immediately, the use of of the image of a prostitute here can either play into our worst habits, uh, or it can cause us to become defensive as to what the text is talking about. So let's just think about literal prostitution for a moment. Prostitution is extremely complicated, a fact that more and more of us are coming to realize. Many women who end up in prostitution are effectively forced into that life by a stick of poverty and the threat of violence and an illusory carrot of of some sort of better life for themselves or their children. So they choose sex work, but only in the way that someone might be cruelly forced at gunpoint to choose to do something. And as soon as they choose it, they're trapped in it. They are figurative and often literal slaves to a lifestyle that subjects them to rape and violence, disease, addiction, and and further cycles of desperation. And before long, the beastly people that profit on them are done with them and they kick them to the curb. So it's a terribly abusive and destructive dynamic, and it's actually the same dynamic that we do see here in Revelation chapter 17. In verse 1, John is invited by this angel to come see the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. And this prostitute, as we'll see, is a woman who's been allured and coerced by powerful men, the kings of the earth, She's fully dependent upon a powerful and blasphemous beast for her food, her clothing, her well-being. And she ends up taking part in violence against others. And finally, at the end of the passage, the beast turns on her, leaving her desolate and naked. And this is the judgment of the great prostitute that John has shown. Judgment in the sense of the inevitable outcome of a beastly system of oppression. So even if we think about this passage in terms of literal prostitution, which is not what it's really about, what we see is a blanket condemnation of the the complex dynamics of prostitution, sex trafficking, and the type of harassment and exploitation that takes place in different places in our culture. God hates this whole system of destructive exploitation. And Revelation tells us time and time again that he is working and that we should be working as his church to bring the whole thing crumbling to the ground. But again, Revelation 17 is not really about literal sexual exploitation. It's not about literal prostitution. Instead, it's about what I call spiritual political prostitution spiritual and and political prostitution. Let's look at the text. I want to look at three things from this chapter. Number one, the political prostitution that's described here in its historical context. This political prostitution as a warning for the church. And then three, I want to talk about a better invitation that is made to us as we close. So before we get into it, Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that it speaks truth to us. We thank you for the difficulties of the book of Revelation, the way they exercise us, stretch us, 
spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. Pray that we would um, be stretched, that we'd be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, that we would become more and more his pure and spotless bride waiting for uh, his final advent and the renewal of all things. Bless us now. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Amen. First of all, in its historical context, this political prostitution that the text is talking about. That's what Revelation 17 is. It's an expose of political prostitution in first century Judaism. The prostitute here is Jerusalem. John's pulling back the curtain to reveal how his own Jewish people have been seduced and exploited by the beast of worldly power. This might seem strange because when you read the text, the prostitute is Babylon or called Babylon. But this woman, Babylon, is really Jerusalem, the complex society of first century Judaism that existed both in the land of Israel and in Jerusalem, the city, but also spread throughout the diaspora of the Roman Empire. And again, if this seems odd to say this refers to Jerusalem and first century Judaism, well, let me show you why this is the right reading. A few points on this. First of all, in verse 3, John is carried away into the wilderness to see a woman. And the last time in Revelation that we were in the wilderness with a woman was chapter 12, when Israel, who was personified as a woman, and she had just given birth to a son, who was Jesus, who was to rule the nations, but she was pursued into the wilderness by a dragon, a serpentine dragon who tried to destroy her. But he couldn't do so, and so he left her there to make war on the church. Or that's what we seem to have remembered from uh, Revelation 12. But now what we see here is that apparently this woman has been seduced and coerced into uh, working with that serpentine dragon. She's clothed here in purple and scarlet the two colors that figure most prominently in Old Testament descriptions of the temple and the tabernacle. She's also wearing priestly attire of gold and gemstones, and she has a priestly miter on her forehead, except that instead of reading uh, holiness to the Lord, her headdress reads, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. So there's priestly Israelite attire. And then the last verse of the chapter, verse 18, tells us that, quote, the woman you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. What is the great city in the book of Revelation? What is the great city throughout biblical history? It's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of the world, biblically speaking, the city of the Messiah, And it shouldn't be uh, surprising to us to see Jerusalem described by the name of a foreign pagan city. Back in chapter 11, verse 8, Jerusalem was referred to as, quote, the great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. And finally, when we see here Babylon the harlot, we're supposed to remember that all throughout the Old Testament, this is a metaphor of harlotry that is used to describe God's people as they turn away from him to the power and the gods of foreign nations. This is what the book of Hosea is all about, but it's also something that we see in the other prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and so forth. So this prostitute, Babylon, is Jerusalem. She represents first century Judaism, geographically distributed throughout the Roman Empire. She's a harlot who commits adultery because while she is supposed to be the bride of Yahweh, she's instead in league with Rome in the killing of the Messiah and now the killing of his people. Verse 6 says, she is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And this beast that she's riding, we know that the beast is first century Rome because of how it's described. This, again, is complicated, but this is uh, some of the complex imagery in the text that I I want to at least uh, show you where this is coming from. First of all, the beast is related to many waters that the woman sits on. Many waters is referenced in 
verses 1 and 15, and clearly refer to the Gentile nations. The beast is an amalgam of the other beasts that we've already met, particularly the dragon and the sea beast, with seven heads and ten horns. This beast was thought to have died, verse 8 says, uh, but yet lives on. And this is in reference to the fact that Rome was thought to have nearly died with the assassination of Julius Caesar, but continued to live on. Verse 9 tells us the beast's seven heads are in reference to the seven hills, that the, uh, and those are the seven hills of Rome. The seven heads also represent seven kingdoms, a reference to Daniel 7, and the succession of empire that Daniel talks about gets picked up here. Babylon, Persia, three distinct phases of the Greek empire. John says he's writing during the sixth kingdom, the Roman empire seen as a succession of Alexander. And he says there's about to be a seventh kingdom that will be brought about and will only last a little time. And that is the reign of Nero. And these ten horns, they represent Rome's ten emperors to that time, whose rule culminates in John's day in the persecution of the church under Nero and not long after the destruction of Jerusalem, the harlot herself, in 70 AD. So that's a quick run-through of this complex symmetry here to make the case of what we're looking at here. And John writes to a church that is facing or is about to face fierce persecution and martyrdom. And in this vision, he sees Jerusalem, Judaism, as this protected minority that is riding on the back of the Roman Empire, collaborating in putting Christians to death. Think about the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, who is uh, sent out from Jerusalem to go and find Christians to put them to death. All over the empire, it was uh, Jewish leaders kicking Christians out of the synagogue, using their own status as a protected minority by the empire to collaborate in the persecution of the early church. And so John sees this vision of what's happening in his own day. And it's a continuation of the same political alliance that put Jesus to death and is now being played out against the life of the early church. So this is an expose of political, political prostitution, the way that Judaism was unfaithful to God, seduced by Rome's power, and the peace that it was provided. And then ultimately at the end of the passage, John says, we'll experience destitution as the natural outcome. And again, we do know that's what happened in AD 70. So this is an account, a visual pictorial account of first century political prostitution. It refers to first century Judaism. But this account, second, is also a, a, a danger to the church, or this this account also points to a danger to the church, a warning against political prostitution today and in every age. Political prostitution remains a dangerous temptation for the people of God. As I mentioned already, Jerusalem, the Jewish nation, was supposed to be Yahweh's bride, but she became a harlot. She re rejected Jesus Christ and jumped in bed with Rome and its massive injustices, greed, and violence. Why did she do it? She did it because Jesus was a Messiah that demanded people follow him to the cross. And Rome made what seemed like a better offer, power, belonging, prosperity, and with no suffering. Just come with me, Rome says, climb on my back, the beast says. They wanted a Christ without the cross, which turns out to be no Christ at all. And while this describes a situation, again, of Judaism in the first century, it's also to a warning to us as the church. The dynamics present here become a pattern of temptation that persists to this present day. The temptations of, of God's people to compromise with the dominant culture, to seek power without the cross, to make compromises in order to secure safety. Remember all the letters we read to the seven churches way back in Revelation 2 and 3? They were largely warnings about not trying to escape the pressures of persecution by compromising. Warnings about the outcome and promises that God would be faithful and reward his saints if they were faithful to him. 
And the same temptation to compromise has been present to the church at different times throughout its history. And the church has been complicit in violence against others, even God's own people. In our own history in the United States, many parts of the church aligned with themselves with the power of slavery and slaveholders. In Soviet Russia, many in the Orthodox Church aligned themselves with the KGB. In Nazi Germany, Protestant and Catholic churches were allured by Hitler's promise of restoring them to cultural prominence. In China today, certain churches are are tempted to come and receive approved status, but it means, in effect, riding on the back of the Communist Party, prostituting themselves at some level to that system, and, and sometimes even putting them at odds with the church that doesn't do that. And so today, just like throughout all of church history, we are warned in this text by a typological reading of it, not to get in bed with worldly power, not to compromise the truth of the gospel and the justice it demands in order to fit in or to obtain power and influence. It's always a temptation. There's always a political party or powerful people saying, get on my back. But it always demands allegiance and compromise. It always ends up by making the church complicit and evil, and it always leaves the church and her witness desolate in the end. Now, I know this is a hard word. Many people in our church and in our city work in politics and are even committed to one of the two major parties. You know, we have people in our church, people on the right and people on the left. And the work you do in these places is good and it's important work. I see disagreement within the church and the different people in our church about the correct policies to achieve certain outcomes, but I'm heartened to see a lot of agreement many times on what those outcomes should be. That's a great thing. Our society needs you in these places, serving Christ, seeking the common good. So as a church, we affirm the good work that you are called to do as an individual in the messy world of politics. But we're also here as a church to preach the transcendent word of God in order to keep us all, all of us, deeply uncomfortable with the beast of worldly power that would allure us. And we think we we can ride on that beast safely, but it will ultimately be our undoing if we prostitute ourselves to it. And so the church itself should be a place where we're made uncomfortable with alliances with worldly power. This is the tension we live in as God's people, that we navigate as citizens of the city of God, living amongst the citizens of the city of man, as St. Augustine says. And as a pastor, it's it's challenging to lead in this. Uh, You have to be faithful to the scriptures and be critical of your own positions and opinions, not letting them blind you or, or restraining the word of God. And you have to be willing to make people uncomfortable. And that's a challenge as well. The only way this works, I think, is through a lot of prayer, a lot of grace with one another, a lot of repentance all around, and a mutual commitment to one another that is far beyond party politics, far stronger than those differences of policy. And if we ever as a church become too comfortable If we climb on the back of a political beast and prostitute ourselves into it, we will end up complicit in violence and eventually our our witness will be destroyed. We are supposed to be made uncomfortable continually by the scripture, by the proclamation of a kingdom that is not of this world, that breaks in, that disarms the worldly powers. Now, it's easier said than done I want to close with an invitation. You know, the beast and the harlot in Revelation 17, they make an invitation. They constitute an invitation. It's an invitation to to compromise, to prostitute ourselves spiritually for the sake of peace, prosperity, power. And the beast and the harlot are deeply alluring. 
In the text, the prostitute's alliance is appealing. She's clothed beautifully. She's powerful on the back of that beast. She offers us to drink from her cup. Even the apostle John seems taken with her. In verse 6, he, he gets caught gawking, and he has to be rebuked by the angel. He's allured by her, but the angel says, do not marvel. Let me show you where she ends up. What I think we're supposed to see here is that unless there's a better invitation that captures us and our imaginations and our desires, we will be powerless against the enticement of compromise with the beast and the harlot. We'll be taken in and allured. We'll find ourselves sucked in, failing to see how it all ends. But here's the good news. Revelation is taking us to a better invitation so that our hearts and minds will be captured by that invitation and not seduced by the beast and the harlot. Revelation is all going to come to a grand climax with an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. An invitation to be the spotless and pure bride of Christ, not the harlot that rides on the beast, but the bride of Christ that marries the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And we'll see this in Revelation 19. Jesus Christ holds out a cup for us. It's not the cup of the power of bloody violence that the harlot has, but the power of his self-giving love. It's a supper of his body and blood given for us. And it comes with a kingdom that never ends. True peace, true prosperity, good power. So the invitation for you today as we close is, what cup are you drinking from? Whose invitation are you accepting? Whose beauty has you entranced? Are you responding to the allure of Lady Folly, the prostitute? Or is Christ, the Lamb, Lady Wisdom, wooing you to that supper of the Lamb? See, because the beast will consume you and leave you desolate and alone. But Jesus gives you himself to consume and leaves you empowered. All of us in our lives have ways specific to us that we are tempted to compromise, that we have compromised. If you've compromised, if you've been compromising in your life, repent. Return to Jesus. Remember the cup that he holds out. Return to him today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.